Great, so hello everybody and um, welcome to this wonderful lecture session from the horror programme at the University of the Underground. I'm Aggie Haynes, I'm the head of the horror programme, which is a critical exploration into illicit societal fears and human passion for horror. We'll be investigating institutions and popular culture through the lens of horror, the horror genre in dramaturgy, film, costume making and more. Uh, the University of the Underground is a free pluralistic and transnational university found in 2017 and birthed in the basements of nightlife venues. Uh, we're a non-profit profit and registered charity so if you'd like to donate uh, please visit the University of the Underground.org on this website. You can find other exciting programming, uh, times and events, um, and also loads of amazing talks and videos on the Instagram page. So today I'm really, really excited and delighted to be joined uh, uh, as part of a group discussion with Joanna Evanstein. So Joanna is a Brooklyn-based multimedia artist, award-winning curator, writer, photographer, producer, art director, designer, and public speaker, which is a really long list of her work. <laughs> um, she does many things. Her work particularly explores the intersections of art and medicine, death and culture, the objective and subjective, the living and the inanimate. She traces her lineage back to Judah Lowe. Oh, I don't know who that is, Joanna. You might have oh, to. I, I will. I, it's actually very horror, so I will share it with you. <laughs> Yeah, so Judah Blow Ben Bezlal, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, who was who credited Not with even sure. <laughs> um, uh, creating and animating the golem in 16th century Prague. She's a proud member of the Order of the Good Death um, and creator of the Mor Morbid Anatomy blog, library and event series. Um, there's lots of books that Jan has written. Um, one that we'll probably be touching on today is Death, a Graveside Companion, as well as The Anatomical Venus um, and things like Morbid Anatomy Anthology. And also I think that you've just started a journal as part of Morbid Anatomy as well. Uh, an online journal, yeah, yes. Right, that's fantastic. And if you haven't seen her TEDx talk, check it out. It's totally awesome. Um, or, or, oh, alternative so look at death. So, Joanna, thank you so much for joining oh, us. Thanks, thanks for your interest. It's, it's a pleasure to talk to all of you. Thanks for having me. So, uh, I mean, maybe to get us started, um, uh, what the students are going to be doing here is they're, they're, they've got to do a lot of collecting information on the topic of horror, and they're mm. going to be going out and working or collaborating with institutions um, interesting. Uh, and making work about it. But what I think is really interesting uh, to get uh, some tips from you perhaps is that you started off as a photographer didn't you and then you you started collecting work by visiting places and then that became there was a knock-on effect I'm just wondering how you yeah. began that process yeah so I you know I should say I you know when I was young I tried lots of different things I tried you know there's so many art projects I'm sure you guys can relate that I was like oh, I'm really into this I'm really into that you know things kind of morph into other things and certain things you think are like the thing don't end up panning out so some uh, uh for me Morbid Anatomy was born from an exhibition so I I had a um I had gone to Europe actually I'll backtrack I'd found a really interesting book about medical museums so I don't know, do you guys know much about medical museums? So in London, you have, for example, the Hunterian Museum or you have the Welcome Collection. I see nodding heads, yeah. So there's museums like that all around the United States and Europe. The best are in Europe and you guys have some of the best actually in the UK. The Welcome is hands down the best that I've ever seen. Um, so I went when I was in 2007, so many years ago now. Uh, no, actually I went in 2005 for the first trip to go see some of these museums that I was reading about in a book. And if you're interested in this topic, the book is called Stuffed Animals and Pickled Heads by Stephen Asma. And it's a history of natural history museums. And he talks about all of these things that really impacted um, my interests and made me want to see the things that he was talking about, these collections of medical oddities going back to the 18th century. These um, There's a Dutch anatomist named Frederick Reusch, who probably some of you have heard of, who created in the 17th century in, in um, Amsterdam, 
tableaus made of real human skeletons. So these sorts of things, these things that were not seen as morbid in their own time and place, but to us, you look at and you're like, what the hell is going on? So basically I traveled through Europe to photograph these in, in 2005. And what I found is the curators were so happy that anyone was interested in this material that they were incredibly generous. And most of them took me out to lunch, gave me books to read, articles to read. And so I basically was ordering all these books off Amazon on my trip. And when I came home, I had boxes and boxes waiting for me. And I, I kind of think of it as my grad school. It just, it kind of had a life of its own. So I just kind of, in order to understand all of these images that I had seen um, and understand why they were made, by whom, when, why, how, what, all of that, I had to read all these books and all these articles. And then I started a blog as a way to kind of um, organize all the material I'd been collecting, all the, the thousands of photos I'd taken because of the age of digital, right? So a lot. Um, and then the information as well, just so I could start to kind of see what shape this. So this, this was an exhibition. I'm sorry, kind of jumped the head without mentioning it. So I'd been commissioned. Okay, sorry. So that in 2005, I, I collected the first images, but then I met a medical museum curator who commissioned me to do an exhibition for her museum that would be this, doing the same kind of work. So I went back to Europe with a more with a little bit of money, not much, but a little, and more of a uh, end project in mind. When I came back, that's when I was overwhelmed with all of this stuff. So I started the blog just as a tool for myself because I was kind of using these links all the time and they, there was no place that you could find all this information in one place. And then I just started to kind of write these little posts that would help me to synthesize all of the material I was taking in to see what it was wanting to say. And to my surprise, this was not at all intended to, to be for anybody else. It was public, but I did, just because it was really a tool, but it quickly developed a following, mostly of women. And I look around the room and I see also mostly women, right? Mostly women. And I began to get emails from people who just said, oh my God, I can't believe there's someone else in the world who is into this stuff and not in a morbid way, but just in a way that it's beautiful and interesting. And, and that's kind of the beginning of morbid anatomy. And so I feel like morbid anatomy then had a life of its own and all I did was follow it. You know, I didn't, I never decided to do really any of the things um, that I ended up doing. It was more just like, I was thinking it was a river, you know, it's like I met certain people and then this certain thing popped up and this, and it just had this weird life and it continues to have this weird life. And at its highest point, uh, well, first, so first we, I was just online and then people began to ask if they could access the books on my bibliography. And um, I had them in my home at that point. These are books I'd collected because they didn't have them in the United States. In England, you have the Welcome Library. We don't have that. We don't have anything like that in the United States. So I just had to buy all the books I wanted to do research from. And so first I started bringing people to my home, but my then boyfriend was like, uh-uh, like, I don't feel comfortable with that. And then I had this art studio space that opened up. I said, okay, I can afford it. So I put bookshelves in and made it open by appointment and that became too much. So then it was open one day a week and then I had volunteers and then we started doing events and then we started doing exhibitions and blah, 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 blah. It just grew and grew and grew. And ultimately I met a woman named Tracy Hurley Martin, who is the wife of, I don't, it might be before your time, but a band, um, he was one of the founding members of Depeche Mode and in the, the band Erasure. And basically she took a liking to the project and said, let's do something bigger. And together we built a, a museum. So for two and a half years in downtown Brooklyn, there was a two floor, three floor actually, because uh, there's a basement black museum that's at the Morbid Anatomy Museum. And it was, it was a wonderful thing, but also as a nonprofit, you can probably understand a very difficult thing to keep alive, especially with New York real estate prices. So we ended up unfortunately closing and then my colleague Letitia and I kind of, now it's a, it's a more amorphous project. So we do have a physical space. We have a library in Brooklyn that's open to the public, but then we have an online series of classes we, that are, um, yeah, for people around the world. We have lectures online. We have in-house classes as well in taxidermy and certain things that you can't teach so well online and um, a bookstore and all sorts of other things. So that's kind of the, the rough trajectory of morbid anatomy. Thanks. Yeah, I'm also wondering, like it, um, because you mentioned before about you know it, where you're staying now, might, people might not necessarily perceive it as morbid. Is why why morbid? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. I think for me, my university background, what I studied at university is a I don't even know if they have it anymore, but at the time it was called intellectual history. And what intellectual history is, is looking at a time period through primary sources only. So you don't read books about history. 
you read uh, the philosophy of the time, the literature of the time, the, you look at the art of the time, the film of the time, if that's what they're doing, as a way to understand the time that made it, but also, and this is, I think, the crucial part for Morbid Anatomy, as a way of understanding ourselves from our own reactions, right? So what I found when I went to Europe for the first time after I'd gone to college is I saw all of these images relating to death that were very beautiful. And I had never seen anything like that growing up in suburban California, where really the only image, like where the dominant images of death when I was growing up in California were those, I don't know if you guys know the, the Faces of Death films. Do you remember those? That might be before your, yeah, there were these VHS tapes that would be furtively passed around that were like real death scenes of people dying, like snuff films essentially, or horror, or, you know, there was no, what I saw when I went to Europe for the first time, and I'm sure you, you guys are in England, you know, or, but the, you know, these beautiful paintings of saints' martyrdoms, these churches decorated with bones or skeleton skulls with bat wings, it just blew my mind. Like that beauty and death could go together. So in the United States, it's, it's completely incongruous. Um, and so I began to collect these images. Uh, I began to just kind of clip things. It was pre-internet. So, you know, I just, I had like a little pile of things. And then I did a, a class after college, it was like continuing ed, which was called art movements. And we had to come up with an exhibition that kind of discussed, um, it was like a postmodern take on something. I thought, well, I'll look at death, changing images of death. So I kind of created this little diorama with images of death from different times and places. And what, what, I'm, what, I, what I realized through looking at all these images is that, again, the tools that I learned as an intellectual historian are by looking at images of the past, you can say, okay, if, it was common to have photographs of dead babies in your in your home. Um, then it was not. Then obviously it was not seen as as taboo. It was not seen as morbid. It was not seen as um, the way it reads now as edgy, right? Like this is just common practice until a certain time. And so I began to just realize that something had changed in our culture that most of the past looked strange to us. You know, like it was the only explanation that makes sense. Like they wouldn't be filling churches with these images if they were subcultural and risque, right? So, so what is it about us? What is it about us that we think of this as morbid? So turning the question back on us. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do with the Morbid Anatomy Project is, re first of all, reclaim the word morbid, which I had been called since a very young age because I've always been into this sort of stuff. And especially as a girl, it's not particularly cool. And at a certain point, after being called morbid over and over, I said, yeah, I guess I'm morbid. And then I thought, well, I just critically thought about, well, like, why? Why is it morbid to think about death or look at images of death? And I began to look at the past, right? And say, well, every other culture did. <laughs> and it wasn't seen as um, perverse or, um, or gross. It was just a part of everyday life. And, and in fact, death, you know, the more I looked, the more I thought, well, actually, death is the greatest human mystery, right? Like, every single person who's lived has died. I will die. All of us in this room will die barring some medical miracles. So like, I think it's actually quite perverse that we, that we can't talk about it, you know? And I should say another thing that kind of radicalized me is my grandmother was a Holocaust survivor and towards the end of her life, she, after her husband had died, she'd been with him since she was 16. She would just say to me when I'd come over, she's like, I just want to die. I'm just ready to go. But you're the only one I can say that to. And I just began, I really thought about that. I thought, well, what a crappy culture that you can't say that, you know, like, and why, why can't we say that? Why is it, what is it that people like, did, I mean, obviously it was sad to hear, but it didn't beyond that. It wasn't, it didn't make me feel afraid or scared or sad. I mean, it made me feel sad, but not, you know what I mean? There's, there's a real taboo. So these are all the kind of things that went into the concept of what I'm doing and also the name. So the actual word morbid anatomy is a, a medical term. I wanted to do something that was a double entendre with a medical term. So I thought about, um, there's a few things I thought about. Gross anatomy is another. So gross anatomy is like dissection, but I didn't like gross. I thought it was too much, but morbid anatomy is actually the study of the diseased corpse in medical school. So it's like pathology. I thought I kind of like that double play. I like that to a doctor, it has one meaning to outsiders, it has a whole other. And then it also is kind of a reclaiming, right? Of this moniker of morbid and saying, yeah, well, if this is morbid, then so be it. Like, I think it's better to be morbid. I think it's more morbid personally, not to think about death and to push all awareness um, away, you know, I think there's something very childish. And anyway, so that's, that's my long answer of why morbid anatomy. Yeah, maybe it might be another question. Well, particularly well, on that same line of thought, in your in your book, which is, you know, death, a grave side companion, you you talk a bit about 
well what I think one of the chapters is about um uh, death as amusement and and I've I yeah I mean I suppose it might be interesting for you to give an example of one that you find particularly interesting but it's yeah. I mean, particularly, you know, we're looking at horror and it's kind of like, oh, there's natural horror, which is like you're saying, so, you know, the reality of dying. And then there's, you know, people go on roller coasters to, you know, to get that thrill that might sort of, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I think I think it's super interesting. And, and so one of my other projects is I was the artist in residence at the Coney Island Museum, I think in 2000 nine 2011 I can't remember but anyway Coney Island I don't know if all of you know it in the United States it's very famous it's the world's first amusement park essentially so it kind of copied what world's fairs were doing all around Europe but made it permanent year-round in the, by the sea in New York City so it was super affordable anyone and there was public transportation that went there so it was open to working class people and middle class people and everybody it was kind of popular it was very very popular with many kinds of people and most of what I'd heard about Coney Island was about exactly what you're saying, roller coasters and hot dogs and things. But when I, I began to do research, I began to find, well, there were these other attractions that no one talks about that are, we are way weirder and way more interesting, which were like these death themed immersive amusements. And there were a lot of them. They also were common at world's fairs. They were common in Paris. Um, but my favorite of all of these was in 1907, there was an attraction at Coney Island called night and morning or a journey through heaven and hell. And this was an attraction. I'm not making this up. I mean, you can read a New York Times piece about it. I'll send it to you if you're interested. It's basically, it was a glass room that you'd go into with 11 other people. The glass coffin, it was a coffin. The, the top would close. Dirt would be thrown on top. You'd look up through the dirt coming down. You'd see weeping willows and other graveside imagery. And then you'd be dropped into the ground as if you were being buried alive. And then you would go on a tour of heaven, hell, and purgatory. I guess it was more like, Hell, have hell, purgatory, and then you'd emerge in heaven. And this is what our ancestors were doing at Coney Island. You know, they were being buried alive. They were um, seeing immersive recreations of the San Francisco earthquake the same year that it had been destroyed by earthquakes. So there's all of these crazy death-themed amusements that um, that were way more epic than the ones we have now. You know, that's that's really what struck me and trying to understand why we don't talk about them. Why, you know, this is a part of this was not. Um, it's the word. This is not a history that was hidden in any way. You know, this is this was well known in its time, but we've kind of chosen collectively to forget them. And then also, I feel like our imaginations have gotten so much smaller. And how did, how did that happen? And the conclusion I came to is film, unfortunately, fortunately and unfortunately, right? Because before film, you know, they would do these attractions every half hour with live casts, you know, with actors and um, special effects and all these other things. And then of course, film comes, it's so much cheaper. You can do better special effects. You can distribute it easily around the world, especially in the era of silent film, right? Where you don't even have to, to, to dub or do, sub, I mean, do subtitles, but just for those few things. So that's probably my favorite death themed amusement. But if you're interested in those sorts of things, there's also Paris had a whole bunch of them. And then the late night, going from the 18th, 18th century until the early, late 19th century, early 20th century, um, including, you've probably heard of the Grand Guignol, I, which I'm sure I'm butchering the pronunciation, you know, but I see some nodding heads. So for, for those of you who don't know, this was like the, the grandfather of slasher films. And this started in the 19th century in an old chapel, an abandoned chapel in Paris. And they would act out these, um, these plays where you would just see people horribly mutilated and killed and tortured and all sorts of things. And then they'd be interspersed with these, it was called hot and cold showers. So it's kind of sex farces. And people would go and they'd faint and you know it was this big sensation in Paris. Um, and then it only stopped in the 1960s because film basically made the special effects. It just wasn't relevant anymore with how great film was getting, right? So if you're interested in that, there's a whole lot about it. And it's the essay I wrote in Death of Graveside Companion kind of traces that history. And I mean, I, I'd be curious to hear what you guys think because as someone, as people who have been studying horror more than I have, it seems to me when I look at the history of death themed amusements that it really only starts in the 18th century. And I think that that is because um, our ideas about death start to be challenged at that time, right? It's like the idea of the eternal soul starts to be questioned. Uh, religion is no longer as strong. You have the age of enlightenment and all of these things. Um, 
But I don't know, is that, I mean, I ask you guys as people who know better, is that about right? Is there horror before the 18th century as we would call it now? I suppose this is this is the first day of our course. So ah, is, okay. <laughs> people might have not explored that yet, but we do have people who are interested in games design or who've made games and you know experiences. So um, yeah, it'd be great to hear from you. Uh, any of you, if like, you know, even if you want to share some work that you've made before, um, if it connects to any of this. And that's cool if no one wants to. I just, I was just curious. I, I, I think as, as younger people, you guys probably know more than I do about the horror genre. And I did type in the name Grand Guignol of the, the, the theater in the chat. And also there's a great book by Mel Gordon um, which is what started me down this, this path with Grand Quino. And what's another thing that's great about that book that I think might be inspiring to all of you is that I found it when I was quite young and he is an academic, was an academic, he's dead now, unfortunately. Um, but he also is a great storyteller and he also cares a lot about images. So it's a, it's a large scale book. It's really beautifully researched. It's impeccably researched, but it's accessible. It's fun. And it's, putting a lens on the kind of history that we're told kind of has no value, right? Or is to be ignored. So he was kind of the first person to write about it in a way that brought attention to this kind of forgotten history. So he's been a real inspiration to me as well. He might inspire you guys as well. Fab, has anyone got any questions for Jan about um, some of the interesting things she's collected over the years? Kat? Hello. Um, I just want to ask you a little bit about um, kind of what you've observed in your research related to the Order of the Good Death. So I'm a really big fan of that organisation. And um, kind of, is there anything you've observed that has changed your opinion about grief and how mm. people relate to death in their own lives, um, kind of within different kind of cultural settings or within different kind of historical ways? Mm. Yeah, I have a few responses to that. The first thing I think of when you say that is um, there's a really, really wonderful book. It's not an easy read, but it's called The Hour of Our Death by Philip Ariz, which is a cultural history of death. It's like the definitive cultural history of death in the West. And what he says, his argument that I, I find compelling, you can choose what you think, but he says that the reason that we, the reason that mourning in the 19th century became so, um, personal and impassioned is because in the 18th century, there's this rise of the nuclear, the close nuclear family. And the idea of the intolerability of losing a loved one really emerges. So then before that people were dying and there was sadness about it, but it wasn't the same way that happens at a certain historical period when um, it's like the rise of the individual, the rise of the irreplaceability, the uniqueness of each person that really starts to come about in the late 18th and early 19th century. And that part of our, the pain of losing a loved one has to do with the time and place in which we're born, if that makes sense. But the other thing that I think um, that I've been noticing recently, so when COVID started, I started a class through Morbid Anatomy called Make Your Own Memento Mori. So basically we talk about the art history of death. It's, it's on the website if anyone's interested. Um, we talk about the history of art and death in three weeks, and then people present their final project on the fourth. And what I've noticed through teaching that over and over and over again is that a lot of people right now, and I see this as tied into the idea of the good death, are really trying to find ways of looking at death that are not just bad. You know, like basically our culture has no, puts no value on death. It is only something to be defeated. It's a horrible enemy. Even when you think of the Grim Reaper, right? The kind of imagery of the Grim Reaper, he's, uh, he comes in and he destroys, you know, he's going to wreck your life. And that's not how all cultures have perceived of death. And I see a lot of art projects or writing projects where people are trying to find either humor with death like a kind of warm humor or beauty and death in a way that I think is um, shifting our cultural dominant view of death as being purely horrible. Does that make sense? And so I think that's what I see with the good death doing as far as um, conceptualizing what death might be. And, you know, I should say, again, my background is history. And so I was just saying this to my husband the other day, like, 
what we were trained to do is to look at when, when I'm looking at, at a at a cultural at something that's happening in our culture, if I try and I'm trying to figure out, is this human nature or is this particular to our own time and place, right? So in other words, is there another way? And death is one of those things, right? So when you look at the past, you realize not everyone through human history has been afraid of death the way we are. And as a matter of fact, I don't think that emerged until the last 200 years. And this is why I see the rise of horror as going with this fear of death that, you know, so if you think of the shift that happens in the late 19th and early 20th century, right, where, first of all, um, the idea of the soul is being questioned, you know, you have Darwin, you have, um, you know, the age of enlightenment thinkers that are trickling down to the mainstream people. So some, you know, people still have faith, some of them, but not everybody. And there was a time when I think most people, unless you were real, really an intellectual outlier, you were a believer, right? And your religion kind of answered all, all of your questions, or at least most of them. So you have that, and then you have, um, a good death is transitioning from dying at home surrounded by your loved ones to taking place at a hospital, kind of as invisible as possible. Then, you know, you also have the shift from the home parlor to the funeral parlor, right? So um, there's this great anecdote from the history of death. This is one of my favorites that I think, again, in 1907, the Ladies Home Journal is writes an article saying, you know, it's time to rebrand the parlor, the living room, because now we have the funeral parlor. So the parlor can become the room for the living. If you think about that, that's what the living room is in the United States, at least that's what we call the living room. So there's this shift, right? So death is moving off stage, And also people are no longer living in such extended families and seeing their, their grandparents die. People are no longer butchering their own meat. And then at least in the United States, most of our war dead are abstracted because they happen overseas, right? So death is just not visible in the way it used to be. And I think that makes it frightening, but also super fascinating and titillating in a way because it's other, you know, it's exotic and other, but for all of human history, death has been our constant companion. It could not be exotic and other until we had the infrastructure to push it out of our lives. You know what I mean? And then I would also say, you know, the other shift that happens in the 18th to 19th century is more and more people move from the country to the city. So, you know, one thing that's also struck me teaching this class over and over again is when I have people who have farms or have a like a background in farms, to them, death is a different feeling altogether in the sense that you know, there's this abstract notion we have, right, that like life and death go in cycles and that death creates fertility for new life. But if you're a farmer, that's very, very literal and concrete in the sense that, you know, that which is dead is worked into the soil and creates new life. It's, it's really real. So we're so distanced from all of that, that now it's just this scary thing, right? And so I think, I think we live in a unique time. And I think that's why I think that's why there's been a rise in horror, why there is horror in general, why it's scary to think about death, you know? That's my theory. But again, I, that's my history lens on, on what you're asking. Could I, could I add something to that? Maybe that yeah. I'm, I'm really interested in, um, is it in Indonesia that the tribe of people who take their family members, they get them up? I can't think of another way of saying it and change them. And um, yeah. uh, I, well, I, first of all, it might be nice to explain that to the students, but also I'm wondering whether, because they're somewhat in between, there seems to be, it's less, you know, black and white, I suppose. Um, yeah, yeah. And that has to do with, you know, ancestor veneration and ancestor veneration is, is like the strongest and most common form of spiritual practice, it seems to me, looking at the historical record. And I'm reading right now a history of Mexico, and there's a similar discussion is what you're saying, where the Spanish are really upset because they want to bury the, the, the dead in the church, and then the Mexicans come and dig them up because they're like, we can't put them in the ground because they're lonely, and it's dark down there, and it's scary, and they bring them back to the house, and there's this constant battle with the corpses of the dead. And it is again, related to spiritual belief, right? So, I mean, I think that to me, that was the biggest, it took me the longest time for it to sink in, but I think one of the biggest differences between us and the people in the past is our, that we don't necessarily believe in the soul after death, you know? And when that happens, things change a lot, but it seems to me that every single other culture ever has believed that the soul exists in some form, it goes to an afterlife or, you know, it goes to a bardo or whatever. So there's, that really, when I think of what makes death hor horrific, it's like if, if all we are is a decaying corpse, 
right? That is horror, right? It's like if our corporeality is overrun with vermin in the ground and that's it, there is a horror to that. But I don't think any other culture had the burden of that belief, which I think is really hard on people. Any other questions? I have a, I'm really curious to, um, what, like I'm wondering if you also somehow relate to death as an ex like beyond the human so like extending itself into I don't know landscape or objects hmm. uh, yeah just curious to hear what you think I'm not sure exactly what you mean you mean like the objects become ensouled or how, can you explain a little bit more yeah I guess touching into like animating non-human um, voices and then attributing death or characteristics of death to that or hmm. redefining death in such a way that perhaps it's not the end of life or maybe it's the absence okay. or the silence I don't know but I think I understand what you're saying um well first of all I, I'll go I'll start by going back to the original the first question um during class which is about the golem so you know my my ancestor I don't have you guys heard of the golem show of hands how many people have heard of the golem okay. oh great so basically it's one of the first I don't think it was considered horror at the time, but it certainly has been co-opted by horror. So it's basically the idea is that um, it's a legend from 17th century Prague. And the, the story goes that the Jewish ghetto was being threatened. Um, they knew that someone was going to, there's going to be a pogrom. And so one of the rabbis talks to God and finds a way to animate a piece of mud. So he sculpts a man out of mud and then he puts, um, on the forehead, he puts a certain set of word, a certain set of letters, um, and then it comes to life. But then kind of like if anyone has seen Fantasia and remembers the Sorcerer's Apprentice, it kind of goes crazy. So basically, it's like a robot. It's like if you don't give it exactly the right instructions, it just starts to create chaos. So, you know, do this. And then he starts, you know, cleaning the floor and then the water starts to flood and all, there's all these kind of mishaps. But he does save the Jewish ghetto. Um, but that idea of kind of animating inanimate objects you know we just did a, i just did a class which explored that very idea it was called enchanted matter and we had um people from all different kind of traditions talk about how their cultures looked at that and so we had um to remember some of them we had a witchcraft practitioner who runs a witchcraft museum kind of talk about animism and basics of kind of um I say magic, but not just magic. It has to do with prayer to these basic kind of tenets of, of how you um, get the gods to intercede on their behalf. We had a Jungian talk about how kind of objects and images are seen to be alive through our projections that we make into them. And then many, many people talking about other kinds of traditions that were more um, traditionally seen that way. So like um, a woman who did who teaches art history about um, Andean art. So talking about how when the Spanish came to the Andes in Peru and Bolivia, they found that the natives were worshiping these rocks or these different things that had what they called huaca, which was, um, it's hard to translate, but like kind of they were sacred, but then how it wasn't attached to the object either. So there were, it was really complicated for the colonizing people who were trying to convert them to Christianity because they destroyed these objects but it didn't mean that the huaca didn't live on. So in fact, by shattering um, an idol, all of those little pieces of the idol had as much power as the original could be distributed much easier. So there are all these kind of complicated, slippery, conflicting ideas of how objects are ensouled. But again, it seems to me that everyone believed it pretty much in some way or other until, until the age of rationality really trickled down to the mainstream. And I think, um, even if you look at the Christian conception of ensoulment, right? Like, like you think of the story of Adam and Eve, Adam starts as mud and God breathes some breath into him. So he's animated matter, right? So I think this idea of animated matter is a through line through all of life in a lot of traditions, right? And um, I don't have anything definitive to say about it, except that I think it's it's much more common to believe that than anything else in, in human history. I hope that that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. It gets me thinking because I was, I was thinking about this documentary that I watched, I think it was like last year. I'm, I'm half Egyptian. So for me, the, 
it's very very yeah growing up around death is um, something that is uh, a cyclical and um, very poetic part of culture mm. um, but Still, it that's amazing yeah definitely that's why because it really extends into the archaeological um Uh, I see field yeah. of uh, Egypt where when you excavate artifacts that are so old even like cat sculptures there was a scene in the documentary that the guy when he lifted it up and dusted it off he's like good morning my friend and it's that kind of um yeah That's so lovely I guess, relation <laughs> yeah. yeah it's like this um friendly interaction with um, yeah peace. yeah yeah that makes It's, me think There's a brilliant article uh, by by Carolyn Dean. I can I'll send it uh, to the class leader after class. I'll make a, a note to do it uh, that I really really loved on exactly. And I was writing down to do this um, on this topic, which is it's called scorned nice. subjects, and it's about it's about the problems that colonizers from Spain encountered when trying to deal with the Andean and Mexican sensibility of enchanted objects or unsold objects and. I can't even do justice to the subtlety of her argument, but she's basically, I mean, it's really conflicting worldviews, right? It's this worldview that we have in the West and that's been a very dominant, we've been very um, successful in destroying so many other cultures with our ideas, right? But this idea that basically of objectivity and in objectivity, there is no life to objects, but almost every other culture thinks there is, you know? And she really talks about that. And I think, I think you're saying, you know, the way that this man treated the object. And even when I taught this class, a, a bunch of the people were not believers in anything. They're rationalists, but they we all relate to objects that way, whether we believe they're in sold or not, right? There's something special. There's things we want to keep. And it, the class really became a discussion of that too. Like, what is that thing? And there's so many different ideas of it. Like we had a speaker too, who was from the like the Eastern Hindu and Buddhist traditions. And he was saying he spent a lot of time in ashrams. And he was talking about how when, your, when the guru dies, it's believed that the photo can be invested with the spirit, the soul, the living force of the, and there's a whole tradition around this. There's a tradition of ensouling these objects. And I think too, the Egyptian um, ceremony of the mouth, opening of the mouth where the statue is. So there's so many, fascinating um examples i think it's it's very rich and then if you think a horror go back to horror and the uncanny right i think of i think of like talkie tina in twilight zone i think of all of these dolls coming to life right and why is that so frightening to us and there's a really I, i'm sure you guys have read the uncanny or are going to probably freud's uncanny but the idea of like why are these things uncanny to us and what he says that i think is so important and so interesting right is because these are things we once believed were true, either personally as children or as a culture, but rationalism has told us is not true. And so when you see something that suggests maybe that those archaic truths might be true and our rationalist truth might not tell us the whole answer, it's terrifying on some deep existential level as to what reality is. And I think that's so much of what really good horror plays with, I think. And if you guys are interested in the uncanny, for, for me, my favorite person who deals with the uncanny is a, a cultural theorist from, what's her name? Terry Castle wrote a book called The Female Thermometer. And you can find a PDF of it online. It's really easy. Um, she's brilliant in general. All the essays in the book are brilliant. But when she talks about the birth of the uncanny, she kind of situates it historically. I talk about this a lot in my class, so I think she, her, she's the most accessible speaker on the uncanny as a product of the enlightenment. So she's basically saying, you know, the 18th century, the enlightenment sought to categorize everything and to give everything a place. And that's what made the uncanny happen because there's things that don't fit that. You know, how do you deal then with ghost stories in that culture where once you would believe ghosts existed outside of yourself, now you're like, am I crazy? Did I see that? So it puts you at war with yourself, you know? And this is something too that I learned when I, I have spent some time in Bolivia with um, a college educated person my own age, but he was born in Bolivia and was educated in Bolivia. And he really believed in a very no nonsense way that everything was in sold and thought that I was crazy for not thinking so. And that was a real challenge to me, you know? And I, he would just point out how my rational mind would just kind of cancel out certain experience because I couldn't explain it. And that's, I think, the danger of this 
this is a worldview that doesn't, I mean, all worldviews don't fit all experience, right? But there's this big part of, we can't deny people are seeing ghosts, whatever that means. I'm not saying they're real, but people are experiencing seeing ghosts, people are experiencing seeing UFOs and our current paradigm doesn't explain for that, you know? And so it creates a more frightening world, I think, because there's always a threat to our worldview by these, this outlying phenomenon that, that we have no explanation for and that our, that our worldview says does not exist, right? So then what happens if you have a near-death experience? What happens if you, you see a ghost or what happens if you feel energy? Like my husband, because he spent time on ashrams, he's constantly like, oh, I feel this energy. I feel that energy. And at first I'm like, well, yeah, I guess, I guess I could see that. I just, I just thought, well, that's just my imagination. You know, that's what we've been taught. But in these other cultures, people are taught to pay attention to those feelings that they have validity. So, so again, going back to intellectual history for me, by seeing that it's not a human universal to think that the world is not ensouled, I have to think there's a good chance that we're wrong and the past is right. You know, we don't know is the fact. And I don't think our tools can tell us what is, but um, many, many more people believe that it was and that it wasn't. <laughs> You know, we're, we're the weirdos in, in history, not, not the people in the past. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. I wanted to ask, because you spoke about the fear of death, and I wanted to ask about historical instances relating to people who like, claim, claim death, like suicide, and perceptions that vary from um, the one of Christianity or the West, which is quite negative and seen as like some selfish or, yeah, I, I wonder if there are perceptions of suicide that are seen as positive. Yeah. I know of some, but yeah. I know of one, uh, which is the Mayans had a special uh, heaven for those who committed suicide and a goddess that had a noose around her neck. I think it was only when they hung themselves. Um, I don't know why, but it was definitely, um, so basically there's different kinds of concepts of heaven and hell, right? And in the Christian world, it's about um, how you behaved in this world, but in the Mayan world, it was about how you died. So if you died in childbirth or um, fighting as a warrior, then you went to this kind of really good heaven. Um, and there was also a pretty good heaven if you committed suicide. If you died normally, you did not go to a good heaven. You went to a kind of a, more like a hell. Which I, so I think it's definitely there. I don't know any other examples, but um, I think it's worth taking a look at. Do you think, sorry, do you think it comes from what, um, does it, are they like given the good heaven? Do you know for what reason? Is it seen as something honorable or? Um... I don't know. I haven't done a lot of reading on that. I just know it exists. And I was really surprised to find that because it's it's so different than our own culture, but I assume it must have been seen as honorable, but why I don't know. Um, I'm sure you could you could find some information out. I mean, when I think about why it's disdained in our own culture, the first thought I have is just maybe it's capitalism. You know, like how dare you take your body that's producing capital out of our system? There's, that's like a sin in a capitalistic culture. But I don't know. That's just. Um, and that's another thing I, I always forget to say when I think about what has changed between our old views of death and our new views of death is the rise and domination of, of capitalist culture, a certain kind of capitalism, right? And I really feel that taking time out to mourn, for example, doesn't go with capitalism. Um, contemplating death doesn't really go with capitalism because you might question how hard you're working for something that has no meaning and, and drop out in some level, right? Like, so anyway. This is a little backtrack there. We probably have time for one or two more questions. Um, Can I ask you something? Hello. Um, I was wondering, what do you think about this idea of like digital reincarnation, like the fact that we gather data so to later have a sort of um, a representation of ourselves through, mm. yeah, I don't know, that people could chat with you because they have the data of your voice and of yeah, of how you react to things yeah. and yes what, what yeah. would you to, to me that, that has a kind of horror kind of feel and I can't help but think of like black black mirror had an episode like that right and um there's a book called Ubik by uh Philip K Dick which deals with this too in a kind of science fiction futuristic way and it never ends well in, in science fiction I kind of feel like I feel like it wouldn't be 
it wouldn't quite provide what you're looking for. You know, I think it's, it's an attempt to, to stave off the sadness of loss, but would you ever really feel satisfied with the, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm, I'm old, so maybe it, it's a, I have a different point of view about it, but I don't, I think I'd rather just mourn someone and let them go than try to keep this kind of slightly off. It seems like the uncanniness of that slight offness would be really disturbing too, in the same way we're talking about ghosts and things, right? Because it wouldn't, part of what humans are is unpredictable on some level and it would never capture that. So it would always be tantalizingly close, but not quite there, I think. I have something yeah, especially to, because oh, sorry sorry no no i just wanted to comment back on what you're saying of digital there was this case that this mummy uh had um still uh pretty solid vocal cords that wow. um, scientists were able to 3d model and uh so you could see like the 3d model of this mummy's vocal cords and from that uh produced like one uh vowel was like wow. <laughs> of how the mummy would have sounded um, back then. Yeah, I just thought of that in terms of what you're saying. Well, wouldn't it be exhausting though, having to keep in touch with all of your ancestors? You know, is it <laughs> emotionally um, worth your time? <laughs> That's well, if it was, it was the way that that uh, Bianca's describing it. I agree, but people do, of course, keep in touch with their ancestors. Like here in Mexico yesterday literally i was walking by someone's house his door was open so i thought it was a shop and i looked in and i was like is this a shop i was like no 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 it's my house but come in come in and he had two altars with his family members there he's like that's my grandfather and like they are keeping in contact with their ancestors by lighting candles by leaving offerings at certain times of year um but in a way that that i think is very beautiful actually um that i've actually taken on i, I built my own ancestor altar after kind of seeing the way that they do it in mexico and you know, going back to what you were saying, Leila, about insold objects, I feel, and I encourage all of you to do this if you want to play with the idea of insold objects, is just make a space that is, you know, called an altar or whatever you wish. Take objects that are meaningful to you and just move them around. I mean, that's what museums are too. You know, like I ran a museum and I did, I've curated. So it's, it's like doing that on a small scale for yourself and lighting a candle there every day and just thinking, you know, whatever it is you're thinking for whatever it is. And, um, asking for the things you want and starting that as a tradition, whether it's, you don't have to have any belief at all, but as a, as a ritual that you do every day, it feels good. And for me, at least it does. And I think it's tapping into something that is deep in our DNA from our history as human beings. Again, belief is out to me. I don't even think about, do I believe it's not about that. And I will say, you know, that's something that really has, that I've learned from being here in Mexico as well as talking to young college educated people about Day of the Dead, for example, or when they go to the graveyard to visit their loved ones. Like, oh, you know, my friend Edson is, oh yeah, I go four times a year. I go on my grandmother's birthday and on Semana Santa and on Day of the Dead on Christmas. And I said, well, what do you do? Well, I talk to her. He's like, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm really talking to her, but I talk to her, you know? And it's like, they don't, again, it's not belief. It's just, that's, that's what we do. Over and over, they'd say, that's what we do. That's what we do. And I think um, there's something those rituals are so deep in human history and we all come from traditions that have done that in some way, shape or form. Um, and then those objects that you play with start to have more meaning or less meaning and then you move them around. You know, some, sometimes, you know, from a Jungian perspective as well, I do Jungian analysis. And there's this idea that I love in the Jungian world that if there's an image that you're attracted to, that you're drawn to, that is deep. That has deep meaning, and that should definitely be paid attention to. And you buy a little figurine of it, or you draw a picture of it, and then you work with it. And eventually, you'll find that the objects that once—and I'm sure you've already noticed this just in your casual life, right? The objects or things that you once were passionate about, then that kind of ends, and something else starts. But then you can kind of keep crafting your altar to be something that's meaningful and has these objects that are meaningful, and move the others away. And it's a way of working with images. Again, I don't know what it means. I don't know if there's a supernatural meaning, but even if it's just the unconscious, there's something meaningful about working with your own images, especially as creatives, right? Like just really cultivating your relationship with your own images. And I think that's where art that speaks to other people comes from as well, if that makes sense. But I think it has to do with ancestor worship too, on some level. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that's such an amazing tip for everyone to start their research, just 
find things around your house that seem significant to what you're interested in and make a museum at home, make an altar at home. What a yeah. great suggestion. I keep moving it around and you'll start to understand things that are non-rational, like things that I couldn't put into words, but you start to get, you just start to, there's a non, yeah, it's hard to put into words, but something happens there and they change and move and morph. And then, you know, the other thing that made me think of Layla is that, um, the way that my husband who spent time on ashrams looks at and sold objects. And, and I hear this in kind of just general talk as well, this idea of energy and energy that we invest in an object, making that object alive for us, you know, but that's literally what they're saying in the Eastern tradition is that all of this attention that these devotees have put on the objects charge them in some way. So again, whether these are literal or metaphorical, there's there are all these really interesting concepts. I think it's very, very rich and, and has a lot to do with horror or could, it has a horror aspect if you want to turn it into its negative. I think it could really make a really good horror uh, film or book or whatever medium it is you're looking to do. Great. We probably have time for one more question, if anyone has one. Okay, so I, I can I, I saw Kat yeah. also maybe had a question. I'm sorry, can I take over? No, no, you go ahead. Okay, so maybe it's 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 too broad, but since you actually uh, mentioned graveyards in your last answer, so uh, I always think about the, the moment like the 1804 Saint Cloud edict by Napoleon. This moment, cemeteries and graveyards go out of the city, and there's this democratization of uh, the display of death and and the way people should uh, relate to it as a, um, as a as a space as a European space as a very important like date and moment um, so I was wondering also uh, hearing from Bianca and everything since our, our relationship to to the possibility of contacting with with dead people and and with our memory of them is expanding is changing so I was I was I was going to ask you how do you feel about this uh, since I've also seen your photos in Yucatan in Mexico like all around the world like very different ways of displaying um, palms and everything like how do you think is is this changing how do you think the the the, the idea of a space a place where this relationship can can like specifically be confined how do you think is that. Uh, culturally changing is, mm. is it happening house because it's also like since we're talking horror it's a place where you know there's there's a huge uh, uh icon iconography of of uh, you know in between zombies and ghosts and everything it's like a place where uh, yeah. the, the unresting is happening a lot of times the haunting yeah well certainly there's a lot more choices for what to do with the dead now at least in the united states you know a lot of the good death stuff is about um green burial and mushroom suits and different kinds of um burial that are more ecological and more connected to nature um i don't know that i believe in the united states it's affecting culture at large in any real way you know i mean i'm sure you are all aware that there's like a big divide in the united states between um, progressive liberal people who are rethinking things and this kind of reactionary movement. Um, in New York City, I didn't see any changes except to say that Greenwood Cemetery, which was a beautiful historic cemetery, opened in 1838. Um, gorgeous green space is now doing a bunch of cultural events and they had to, they really had to kind of um, work with their more conservative audience, people who have people buried there who, you know, playing, being very careful not to be disrespectful. But, you know, one thing that really struck me when I was doing, we had a residency there and I learned when I was there that in the 19th century, early 19th century, after Niagara Falls, Greenwood Cemetery was the biggest tourist attraction in New York City, in New York State rather, which gives you a sense that, um, that even when these garden cemeteries started, they weren't places of they weren't the, the kind of idea we have right now of um, the only way to approach death is somber, meditative, you know, sad, I think is pretty new. Like people used to picnic at cemeteries not long ago. And in Europe, I remember when I was in Denmark, I remember seeing just people hanging out at the cemetery, couples on dates and stuff like that. Um, it's a green space. And as a matter of fact, the, the, the garden cemeteries preceded 
the first public parks in New York. The parks were based on the popularity of the cemeteries, right? So, you know, and also this idea of uh, bodies permanently laid to rest is pretty new, right? So um, before Napoleon and before the garden cemeteries, as, as you guys probably all know, people would be buried in churchyards. And then as soon as the flesh had decayed off, they'd, um, they would take the bones out and move them into charnel houses. Uh, so the bones would be on display, not as, you wouldn't know who was who, right? So then it becomes an abstract memento mori. It's not like you could go visit your grandmother there, right? So again, going back to what we were saying with Philip Arise and the idea of the intolerable loss of the loved one is also tied in with the rise of this new kind of cemetery where people are buried in perpetuity, right? Which is new. And I mean, who knows what that will mean? I was saying Latin America, you'll see like little eviction signs where basically if people haven't paid their dues, they take the bones out. So, um, so I don't know, I guess in Mexico, I think people have a very good relationship with it. In the United States, I don't really see it shifting in any fundamental way personally. Um, I haven't seen any evidence of it. There's certainly the good death people who are pushing for things and there are people who are interested. I mean, what I see more change in, frankly, is death doula ship and this idea of, how, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the death doula. It's like a midwife that helps you through the death process. And I, in my classes, I get a lot of people who either are death doulas or are training to be death doulas. It's really the hospice work. And I see a lot more interest in that. I think that I see more changes in how we die than what happens to the body after death and how we treat that space. Um, but again, I feel like I'm very, very attracted to the ancestor altar more than I am to the place of burial. And I think there is something about our current belief, I guess, that the soul doesn't survive the body that, that makes us identify identity with the body itself, you know, and really, really get attached to what happens to the body after death in a way that is, I think, um, very particular. You know, people often ask me in my line of work, how do, what do you want to happen to your body after you die? I was like, well, I don't, I don't really care. It's for my loved ones to worry about. Like, I don't, my, I'm not identified with my body really, you know? Um, but I think a lot of people that becomes a real locus of identity. Well, um, unfortunately, we might have to stop there. I feel like we yeah. could talk about this for ages. There have been such interesting questions. But Joanna, thank you so much for your time. Oh, it's thanks for fabulous. having me. It's been great to meet all of you and good luck with your, your work. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we'll be in touch. I'll send the students some of the references that you sent as well. So yeah. thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to send that article to you right as soon as I hang up. Great. Thank you. Thanks for Bye, joining. Bye, everybody. <laughs> thank you.